everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Pawtucket and all stops in between. Thank you for listening. My name's Chris Hatfield. I am the executive editor of Sox Prospects, and I'm joined as always by our director of scouting, Ian Cundell. Ian, uh, what happened in the soccer matches this morning real quick? You win or what? Uh, we did win. VAR is a joke. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. That's, that's all, talking that's soccer. Enough. That's enough. That's all we need. That's all we need. Really quick. Just being polite. Um, we want to thank you all for listening. As always, uh, we got a pretty good episode for you today here, guys. I think we're going to follow up on our scouting notes uh, from the last month or so. We're going to talk Portland Sea Dogs. We're going to talk Greenville Drive. And we're going to ha- talk with Mike Rickard. That's right. Mike Rickard, the VP of Amateur Scouting for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, got a chance to chat with him this week. Um, to talk for about what 35 minutes Ian you've already had a chance to listen to it we'll do we'll do our thoughts on the interview maybe after the after we've spliced that into this episode um some highlights from that some some neat things to talk about from there so really good episode for you guys this week uh as always we want to shout out our five dollar level patreon supporters that's sock signatures cal costigan tyler woodrow jeff trainer david nardone tim harding bill stanton deb kendall evan kirkwood hurricanes one chris fox james o'hara nathan kenyon andrew wallen lendl martin david b ben burnett Cy, al mendel and kevin katridis uh Catridis, who confirmed that I pronounced his name right, and I was pretty pumped about it, although that time I probably screwed it up. But anyways, um, you can support the podcast at podcast.com slash Sox Prospects. And if you pledge $2 or more per episode, you're going to get access to the Patreon game updates. And, Ian, I put two up from you yesterday. I'm going to put another two up from you today, and I'm going to record one today. Uh, So that's another, like, what, 10 minutes each? That's another, another, like, 50 to 60 minutes of content. Yeah, they're, Um, like, 10 to 12 minutes, 13 yeah. minutes. So that's that's a lot of content that you're getting for two, two bucks an episode. We record, what, 20, 25 of them a year. So yeah. it's it's well worth your while. That's just from this week. So, mm-hmm. um, And I'm going to Lowell probably tomorrow and the next day. Go. There you go. Which is, I think it's Zephyr John and Song. So that'll be good. The Zephyr Song. Gotta love it. And then um, maybe murphy wednesday michael wednesday too we'll see how it goes there you go all right yeah some speaking of uh, some notes on all three of those guys in the mike record interview by the way so make sure you stay tuned for that um but yeah and finally if you want to talk we want to talk about what you want to hear about so send your emails to podcast at socksprospects.com um we got one this week and it's about a guy we would have talked about anyway so excellent timing uh, on that um so I, i guess really quick ian one quick news note from this week that we should mention um, and that, of course, is the return He's back. from injury of Roldani Baldwin. Right? Yes. Right? I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's good. I mean, uh, kidding aside, as far as catchers in the system, I think at this point there's about three or four guys ahead of him. It's not like when a year ago when he was the top catching prospect in the system. Yeah, calling but, him a catching prospect was always a debatable Thing, yeah, I mean, yeah. he had work to do. I mean, we'll see what he looks like. Um, but okay, kidding aside, um, in the same game that Baldwin came back and played his first game of the year after a leg injury, um, Jay Groom is back. Uh, the big lefty threw one inning. Uh, I think it was two Ks, a ground out, and a ground ball single. Infield single, I think, yeah. Right, right, infield, yes, which presumably was on a ground ball. Yes, um, but that doesn't but necessarily stayed in the infield. infield. Didn't go through the infield. Good point. Yeah. Infield Don't single. Me. Uh, I'm not challenging you. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, good to see Groom back. Uh, probably, yeah, he's like, I heard he was like ninety three, ninety four. I think yeah, Alex. Alex was, everyone, everyone's heard it. Like, yeah, Alex Spear I, reported. Yeah, it. yeah, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, not everyone would have seen it. Not everyone who listens to this is on Twitter. Yeah. So ninety three to ninety four is good. He he said in an interview with Alex, presumably a phoner, that um, that he felt all of his stuff was back. He threw all three pitches. They said, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think for me, it's like. I'm just interested to see how they use him the rest of the year. Um, I assume he's going to pitch like one inning, maybe two inning stints at most with the yep. GCL. I'm wondering if they send him to Lowell at the end of the year because I think Lowell mm. is going to make the playoffs most likely. Oh, good point. And good point. I don't think the up. GCL is. I'm not 100% positive. No, I think but. they might make the playoffs. The GCL, right? No, they're not. They're in third in the division. Hey, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. Oh, also our standings are wrong because we don't have the five team division. We have four divisions. Um, but anyway, I don't think the GCLs make the playoffs. I guess maybe they're in the wild card hunt, but I think they're a little out of it. Whereas Lowell's 
most likely making the playoffs. They're five games up, and I think there's only like seven games left in the regular season or eight games or something. Yeah, the GCL so, Red Sox, oh, it's kind of funny. If you look on MILB.com, they still have a Northwest division with no one in it. Dear. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So they're outside. They're on the outside looking in. Although eh, they're two and a half back, so they could. But um, new. But I think new so. I'm just gonna, league, the standings. interesting thing to me will be if they decide to promote uh, Groom to Lowell. Just if that season goes a little longer, because the Lowell yeah, season they, ends the third, I think, and then they, if the playoffs, yeah, yeah, they lead their division by five games. So yeah, there's, definitely there's the yeah, there's like seven games left. Yeah, but um. Yeah, so the GCL has five games left, so at most he's going to get one more start in the GCL. So um, I think I would not be surprised if he'd be seen in Lowell for a couple starts, which would be interesting and helpful for me because I should be able to get to see them um, if they're at home or Connecticut, which would be like, the I think, the third straight year. or sec- No, it would have been three of the last four years I've made a trip to Connecticut to see him pitch. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's really funny. Because he rehabbed there two years ago, and then he pitched there, obviously, like one start at the end of the first year there. So okay, that would be ironic. But, um, yeah, That's it's really just good funny. to see him back healthy, uh, I assume. I mean, I've gotten a few questions on it. I assume he'll go to, in, to fall instructs. Yeah. I think that's the oh, plan. that's for sure the plan. Um, I mean, there's no and reason And then he'll, be. he'll get more innings there, and then we'll kind of go from there. So I think the key for him is just to have a, you know, close out the season healthy and come in and have a full off season to get ready for next year. GCL Sox have been eliminated, by the way. Okay, yeah. So he's probably, if they're going to try to get him they'll, innings, they'll probably, yeah, yeah, they'll probably have him pitch in front of like one of the piggyback starters or something. Like he'll take that fifth spot in the rotation that's not yeah, the three draftees or Aldo. Yeah. And like he'll be piggybacked by Lucas or YPA or something. Yeah. Yeah. But just, yeah. I'll, I'll know a little bit. If he's up there, that like, that's such a that playoff rotation could be filthy because <laughs> yeah. if you're running like song out there for three innings in the playoffs and then Zephyr John for three, like I don't know if they do that, they'd piggyback the starters like that. But, yeah. yeah, it would depend on what the playoff format is. Yeah, so that's just something. Just it'd be interesting how they work that. Given they have like they could have like five guys you would want opening games, but obviously in the playoffs that's not really feasible. Yeah, so. well, I mean. It, I mean, Usniel Padron Artiles is a perfectly viable New York Penn League playoff starter too. Okay, yeah. So the, the semi LCS. the semifinal is best two out of three, and then the LCS, the league championship, is the two best three, two out of three. Also. Yeah. So you're only going to get six games at most. So I could definitely see them double piggybacking guys. Yeah. So it'll be yeah. interesting, but um, yeah, Jay Groom's back, and that's good. That is a good thing. You got a lot of questions about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, so we've got them ranked right now sixth. Um, Darwins and Hernandez is going to graduate on September 1st, um, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to jump Hilberto over him, which I get, but I... Did you see he had like four more hits yesterday? Did he? He's stealing now. He had two steals yesterday. I saw, yeah, maybe they took the reins off a little bit. I I think it's an organizational thing. I, I, that's my theory still. It's gotta be. It's gotta Um, be. Yeah. Because and, and you know what I can kind of understand at those le- at that level because you don't want guys running into outs. So yeah, um, well I, I guess yeah because you want guys to get at bats. Exactly, it's um, like it's development, but yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So, but I mean, you're I, I would keep them at, at five or I don't six. Know. We'll, we'll we'll see what happens. I haven't decided Drum. yet. We'll, it'll probably be an interesting discussion we'll have after um, for next month's rankings in a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, honestly, I care more about what he looks like next spring than what you see at instructs. Does that make for, sense? For groom? For groom. Yeah, obviously. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. That's oh, what you yeah, meant? Yeah, yeah. yeah I no, I'm saying groom. groom five or six, not Hilberto. I'm talk, we're still talking about yeah, groom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Like, it instructs this year. It's just, I don't really care how he looks. I just want him to see on the mount. That's all Get I care reps. about. Get reps. Versus for or next see the year's. body. See what the body looks like I after heard it, Yeah, I heard it looks, he looks in good shape. Alex but wrote yeah, about that, yeah. Apparently he... For, yeah. The key is for to, for him to have a full off season to be healthy and going into next year. That's the key for him. That sounds about right. Yeah, yep. and and then you know next spring is when I'll care a little bit more about how everything looks. If it looks like, you know, the game we saw, you know, that was apparently his last game before the one this week. Um, yeah, saw his last pitch. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, and and for those like I understand, it's obviously been like a kind of a lost couple of years for him. But even if he comes back next year and goes to Greenville, he'll be the same age as Thad Ward was when he started in Greenville this year. So like, it's not the end of the world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but the problem with Groom is his Rule 5 status because he's going to be Rule 5 eligible after next season. And Well, no, because you're going to have to make a decision whether or not to protect him, and he's going to be in Salem. I I agree. 
but we'll get there. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying that like in terms of age behind the curve, it's not that bad. No, his age That's thing all. is fine. The problem is that when you, then when you put him on the 40, yeah, now, he's start, that, now his options are starting to run. Yeah, that's the bigger issue. But we'll, that's a discussion for next year. Yeah, it's fair. I'm just saying. I'm just putting it on the table. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, all right. Well, we got we got a lot to get to, Ian. Let's go. You want to talk about Portland, or you want me to talk about Greenville first? Um, I don't know. We can do whichever. Do you want to do Greenville to get it out of the way quickly, and then move on to Portland? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've got all my stuff. Well, it's fresh in my memory. Um, caught a couple of games. Um, of the Greenville Drive in Hagerstown this week, kind of life, you know, while it has conspired against me doing a whole lot this year, um, you know, maybe you can tell me guys you want to hear about, but I'll, I'll touch on the obvious ones. While life kind of conspired against us getting a podcast out for a while, it was extremely helpful in allowing me to have time to get, uh, make the two hour trek up to, up to Hagerstown to see the drive this week, a couple of games. Uh, I guess we'll start with the number one prospect in the system with Tristan Casas. Uh, I mean, that's probably the guy that everybody wants to hear about uh, in the two games. You know, in the game one, didn't really do a whole lot. Uh, he did have a uh, yeah, he did have a hit in the ninth in the first game. So he he hit it through the shift. He's getting shifted to the pull side, um, to the right side. So he went, you know, uh, a couple of ground outs, struck out swinging on a slider, and in the ninth. Singled through the right side and then took second on a misplay by the right fielder. So for a big body, he can kind of get the motor going when he needs to. I, I, he's still such a, I mean, it's a, such a strange body type. Ian, we were kind of talking about this. Um, it's, it's, he's like Bambi, but like huge. Like it's just all, he's, it's, um, it, it, you want to say he's all limbs, but he's not. He's got a big torso as well. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a good baseball instincts, good move by him to, to, to recognize that the right fielder was misplaying a, a single through the right side and, you know, he took advantage of it. Um, the second game was the one that really he, he showed off, um, had a couple of doubles. The first was a double to center field, uh, that he hit off of the wall in center in Hagerstown. So slightly to the right, as you're looking at it from home plate of dead center is 380. It goes back from there as you go towards center and into left field, and the wall is probably 25 feet up. And he hit it like three quarters of the way off the top of the wall. It had to have been, been over 400 feet. Um, 101 miles per hour off the bat. I, I was able to get the track man reading on it. Um, just crushed a line drive that, you know, the only other player that I've seen hit it that far is Raphael Devers when he was with, um, with Greenville. Um, I think was Devers with them. Yeah, I think it was Devers. Um, would have been like 20. Hmm. When was Devers in Greenville? In 2015. 15. Yeah. Okay. So that's when on, it was on, on that loaded, like the best minor league team I think I've ever seen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So 2015. So that's when I would have saw him in Hagerstown. Okay, good. Uh, it just seemed like this is 2019 and he's one of the best players in baseball. That was way too recent, but um, uh, the best player in baseball. Yeah, that's true. Sorry. I miss. <laughs> Um, let's see, walked in the fourth and then in the sixth, Casas hit another double on a line drive to right that was 107 miles per hour off the bat, just croaked. Um, the right fielder thought he had a play on it and then it was kind of comical the way you just saw his eyes get big and just like, oh no, as the ball was just kept carrying over his head. Um, yeah, just two smoked balls. The thing I love about Casas, Ian, is the way he chokes up like an inch and a half on the bat. It makes it look like a freaking toothpick. Well, he only does that really with two strikes. No, now, though. no, he doesn't. Oh, that was what he was doing earlier in the year. No, he does it almost every at bat now, almost <laughs> every pitch. It's like he altered. I didn't notice him doing it every pitch, but then once I became aware of it, like it, it, I think he might be doing it every pitch. But um, yeah, he alternates the crouch thing. He doesn't always do it, but he does it sometimes. Might depend on the pitcher. Um, but, yeah, I mean, plus, plus raw, easy all-fields power is what we have. That's absolutely true. Um, in the field, looked like he's fine at first. I've got no problem with him at first. He's a, probably an average defender there. Um, could get better. Uh, doesn't have great range, but he can move fine. Um, yeah, I liked what I saw at Acasas. Uh, he's a big boy. It's It's an atypical player for what we're used to seeing. He's not this kind of, like, looks like he could play linebacker type, but... <laughs> he's like, he looks like an O lineman. His limbs are so long, though. It's he looks like an O lineman, and I don't mean that in the sense of like after an O lineman puts on an extra fifty pounds just to be bigger. 
No. It's like what the old linemen slim down to when they retire. Yeah, like the, he's like the kid in high school, though, who's like a sophomore in high school who's 240 pounds, but like 6'6", six, six, and you're like, yeah. okay, this guy's going to be like... He's just got to grow into his Like, that's limbs. a great frame, but yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I, I... The power, yeah. I mean, the yeah. power's a carrying tool, but like, I think he's going to hit, too. I mean, the reports, I mean, I've been getting from scouts who've seen him have all been very Same. encouraging. Same. Everyone's a fan. Yeah, except like, not at third base, but he's basically not playing third base at this point. I know I mean, the no scout we both know happened to catch the drive while Brandon Howlett was out and Casas was the backup third baseman. So he played a lot of third base that week. But, um, but yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, you're looking at like a potential plus hit, plus power, like middle of the order bat. That's yeah, he's he's exciting. To get to a guy that I did just mention, Brandon Howlett. Um, I mean, Ian, we've talked about Anthony Flores needing an offseason. Brandon Howlett needs more an offseason more. Well, I think uh, his, he's in the offseason now because he's injured. So, Did he go down? Yeah, he got hurt yesterday oh, or two he? days ago. So I think he's done for the year. I mean, he – yeah. I mean, he just – you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he's that was a phantom thing, but... injury. He's going to have to. I yeah. mean, he just doesn't. I mean, I, I saw him in two games. He struck out three time, four times, three of them swinging. Um, when he's not striking, he just he just looks lost up there in the sense that he's just he's trying. Um, he's getting shifted to pull. Um, his swing is. I, I noticed it's just so rotational. I don't know. Has it always been like that? Like it just looks like his his bat's rotating with his like upper body. I don't know. It's it's not as. I don't know. I'd have to see video. Fluid. Um, I mean, he just looks like he's just, just just like we said, he's just trying too hard up there. He's like he's trying to get two singles in the same at bat, um, if not two home runs. I mean, he's not swinging out of his shoes in like a Michael Chavis sort of way or anything like that. I mean, he's just going up there and you know overthinking it. Um, even in the field, honestly, I could take it or leave it. It's weird. He throws straight over the top which is really strange for a third baseman. Like, he'll field it, bring it up, and throw right over the top, With even on close plays. It wasn't like a, you know, I've got plenty of time, so I'm going to come over the top to make sure I throw it right and don't put spin on it or something. He he was doing that on every play. The, just, it, the motion just didn't seem that great for me. Um, you know, clearly he's pressing. Clearly it's a long season, and he's kind of, you know, he's had times this season when the numbers have been there. But the same at the same time, during those times, the average of balls in play has been extremely high, and I'm starting to wonder if it just might have been, you know, kind of regressing to the mean a little bit. Um, didn't love what I saw out of him, but, I, you know, like I said, a caveat of just it's late in the season. It's his first full pro season. Um, I will say that at this point I'll have no – qualms about putting Decker over him in my next yeah. rankings at this point. Um, just based on what I've seen, even though they're the same draft year, same age, and one went to Greenville. Just how it, uh, like I said, he needs an off season. I'm fine with him repeating Greenville next year. He'll still be on a normal development track just as long as he gets going. Um, on Howlett quickly, I made that injury thing. I was thinking about someone else, so he's not hurt. I was going to say, yeah. I didn't he's think just he been was. very bad. I mean, I'm looking at this like month by month splits, and it's like, he was April was bad, which it was for almost everyone in Greenville. May was better. June was really good, and then July was very bad. And August has just been a disaster. He's hitting like one fifty, two eighty two, two thirty three this month. And yeah. I think he's just, as you said, it might be just worn down the, the rigors of the first pro season. Or rigors tough. of the first season, and this is probably the first time he's struggled like this. Yeah, for you know? sure. And, and that's and very tough you start, mentally. You start pressing. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's a tough thing mentally. And that's, by the way, it's a, not a bad thing for a guy to struggle. You know, guy. I know a lot of times, like on our forums or people who tweeted us, like this guy's having success, promote him. This guy is not doing well, demote him. Like, no, like you don't have to be hitting like two eighty, three fifty, four twenty to stay at a level. Like. Anything above that, you get promoted. Anything below that, you get demoted. That's not how it works. Working through struggles is a good thing developmentally, or at least it can be. And I'm interested to see how he comes out on the other side. Um, you know, anyone else that you, you want to mention? I, I want me to mention. I'll mention Tyler Dearden did hit a home run um, in the, the second game that I saw. Smoked a home run down the right field line. Kind of funny in that he kind of watched it from the plate. Uh, he didn't have another at bat. I don't know what would have happened in the next at bat. I think it was in part because it was potentially going to go foul and there was no doubt that it was gone. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the field, it's left field only. Um, I still don't love the hit tool there. 
Um, there's some pop. I mean, he had a single in the first game and a couple in the second game. But other than the home run, I mean, I, the power didn't really impress me um, for Dearden. Uh, let's see, who else did I see? I saw Curran Suarez again, who seems to just be getting promoted and demoted from teams so that I see him. Um, interesting thing with Suarez, Ian, plus arm in right field. That's he, was, he was playing right field? Yeah, well, because they uh, had um, uh, Brandon in center. Oh, uh, well, no, he played second base when I saw him this year. Well, because he was, so it's like he used to be a second baseman. They moved no, him to did, center yeah. field last year. This year in Salem, he was playing a lot of second base. Um, and he was playing sec- some second base in Lowell. He kind of plays both now, but he's a, it's a strong outfield arm. That's new. Um, I hadn't seen that before, but uh, at the plate, he didn't do much. He was 0 for 6 with a hit by pitch. Um, oh, Cole Brannon, I mean, he's a guy we've talked about. So in the field, I'd say he's probably got at least plus, if not better, range at this point in center field. I mean, he was flying all over the place in center field using that speed. So that part of his game has developed. Um, At the plate, he had a hit in the first game and he had a double in the second game. But, I mean, even the double, I mean, it was a, you know, 92 miles per hour off the bat. I mean, he hit it well, but it wasn't smoked. I mean, there's just been no physical development. He still looks incredibly skinny. Um, Easily one of the smallest players in the system. I, I need to see a little bit more meat on those bones it's just it's it's a lean frame i just don't know how he's going to get anything on the ball um you know got doubled up in the first game with which with his speed you would want him to not be doubled up at this level uh i mean he'll go up to salem next year i'm still kind of out on cole brannon uh even as a second rounder uh da, 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 da. who else anybody else seeing that you want to know about uh pitchers yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's get to the pitchers. Good point. Um, the pitcher that I know you were you were meaning to ask about, Ian, is of course Kevin Biondick, um, or not? Uh, but he was. I mean, he's interesting in the sense that he's now a true knuckleballer, complete with literally the Tim Wakefield mechanics. Uh, so that was interesting. I mean, he worked his way through a game quickly, which is all I could ask about him. But uh, yeah. So I mean, he the the, the knuckleball is like. 70s, low 70s knuckleball. He'll mix in a mid 80s fastball, um, but you can kind of know it. You kind of know it. He, he'll dial it up to 89 when he needs to, but you can tell it's coming because the motion's just a lot different. I mean, he was throwing some 86, 80, 85, 86, 87 late. Um, his command really comes and goes, um, especially late in his outing. He went six. He really got tired. Um, tremendous pickoff move, which is good because the thing with a knuckleballer in a ball is that if someone gets on base it's a crisis because the catchers just aren't able to deal with a pitch coming in at 70 everyone in the park knowing it's coming in at 70 and the runner running um so he did pick a couple guys off um they did catch a guy stealing on a pitch out so but it's just when when anyone gets on base against a knuckleballer at that level it completely changes how beyond it had to pitch to guys so luckily he kept runners off the bases um but, yeah, uh, I mean, he's interest, it, interesting if you want to see a knuckleballer. Um, more importantly, Chase Shugart uh, pitched the second night. Shugart, I liked a lot. Um, you know, the fastball sat mostly 92 to 94. He touched 96 once, 95 a few times. Um, had a couple that were like 91 and 90 that I don't know if he was trying to do a two-seam thing or something. Um, curveball was anywhere from 71 to 78. Slider was 82 to 86. Uh, Changeup was anywhere from 81 to 88. I think there was one 88. It was mostly kind of 80, 40, 5, 86. Um, the curveball to me was the better secondary, which I guess for you when you saw him last year, Ian, the slider was the better secondary. Um, he's nodding his head. This is an audio podcast, Ian. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, his slider was good. It instructs. Uh, it was a really good pitch. Yeah, I mean, the slider, I mean, it was the short, tight break like you had. Um, but the curveball to me, I mean, he flashed a couple that I thought I thought it flashed at least above average, if not it's like one or two that might have been 60s. But I'm not saying it's a plus pitch. Uh, it was inconsistent. From, you can tell from that wide velo band. I mean, 
you know, it was mostly 73 to 76, 77, but there was definitely one at 71 that was really slow. Um, that's slower than last year. Cause when I saw him, it was like 77 to 80. Yeah. So I think he might be throwing it different, but he was able to throw it to get guys to chase and he was able to drop it in for a strike, you know, kind of backdoor it to, um, to left handers. I, I liked the curveball better. The changeup was a show me pitch. Um, like you have it as inconsistent movement, firm, sometimes looked like, looked like a fastball that he took something off of. Um, he did throw a few that showed some drop. Um, but the thing that got me is with the three – well, let me talk first. I mean, the frame, he's short. He's I think it's he listed at six feet. Um, I'm the one with the roster. I'm he's listed at like 5'10". He's listed at 5'10". Uh, that's probably accurate. Um, I just It's not a great starter's frame. Um, he definitely tired. He went six. Um, and it was weird. He His – his command and, and control also just really came and went on him. I mean, in a stretch but in the third, fourth, and fifth innings, he threw 20 strikes on 24 pitches, um, including balls in play. Um, but, I mean, he definitely had his command. In the sixth, the wheels fell off. Um, he came out four-pitch walk, um, ball single, um, foul pop-up called strike, single, four-pitch walk, single, and then finally got an F8 to get out of the inning uh, on a 3-1 count. So in that inning, he threw seven strikes, including balls in play, in 19 pitches. So the command really came and went on him. Um, Part of that might have just been fatigue. It wasn't particularly hot. I mean, it wasn't cool. I mean, it was warm. Um, But, you know, he's a Texas boy. Uh, The frame, I I don't know if he's going to be able to you know, keep this velo. He, he definitely was throwing 94, 93, 94 in the sixth. But, um, you know, I worry about his ability to get past five. The other thing is just the way he mixed his pitches. He was throwing all four pitches from, like, batter three, which is not something that, like, when college guys enter the system, you know, first time through the order. And, like, Denny Reyes does this. We'll talk about him in a minute. He's not throwing all four pitches in the first inning. He's throw he's throwing, you know, fastball, slider, maybe the change up to to, you know, lefties, um and then or, or to righties. I forgot he's left handed, right? Yeah. Anyway, and then he'll start mixing in the curve the second time through the order. Shugart, and I don't know whether this is a Samuel Miranda calling the game thing or a Shugart thing, but it was like in the first inning, he threw all four pitches. Um, you know, in the first inning, he threw mostly fastballs, but three curves, a slider, and four changeups. Like, and it wasn't really discriminatory based on what side of the plate a guy was coming, you know, was hitting from. He was throw, mixing everything early, and just the plan didn't really seem to be there. Granted, he's an A ball, but like for a college guy, you would think he had a little bit more of an idea of, you know, how he's going to set guys up. And I just didn't see him setting guys up, you know, fast, you know, throw a couple curveballs, set them up for 95 at the chin, you know, uh, throw fastball outside, fastball outside, fastball up, drop a curve in on him. Um, you know, he wasn't really setting guys up for everything. He was just kind of keeping guys guessing that what I told you before we started recording, it was almost like a kid playing MLB the show, right? Where it's like, you're just picking pitches. So well, that's not necessarily him though, because at an A ball, what I was saying, it could be it's Sam. not clear that they're calling. He, 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 like pitchers aren't calling their own games in A ball, so right. But I mean, he could, you know, so that could be, you know, Samuel Miranda calling the game could be the pitching coach. You know, could be uh, who's the pitching coach in Greenville now? Uh, oh, Kippers, the pitching coach in Greenville now. So I don't know if Kippers the one calling the game, but maybe they're just having him work on throwing every pitch and every count. But that was that really stood out to me. Um, Reliever wise, didn't see Yon Ibar because he got promoted. Maybe we should mention him, Ian, because you picked something out. Oh here. yeah, that's the other. That actually was important. He's been really good lately. Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, I saw Robbie Baker, who you've seen recently. It's an org arm. I mean, he's you know throws from the stretch, topped out at ninety. Uh, Yorvin Pentoja is true reliever now. He was nothing but fastballs. Oh, I threw one change up at eighty two, but ninety to ninety two with the fastball. Um, who relieved Shugart? Oh, Demchak. I saw Alex Demchak, who who is, I mean, the type of guy that's going to shove in low A. Uh, you know, he, it's an uncomfortable at bat for righties. I mean, he's got that kind of low three quarters. Um, he was, you know, eighty eight to ninety, but it gets on you quick because of deception. I think he gets it looked like he was getting really good extension too. 
um, you know, slider change up. Just like I said, an uncomfortable at bat. I don't know how it's going to play up. I'm going to need to see it. Any any reliever, I'm going to need to see it in, in Portland. But um, why don't you mention Yohan Ibarian? Because I missed him because he got promoted because he's been sh- absolutely shoving. Yeah, just I was just surprised because I saw he got promoted and I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Because like, right. his overall season stats are pretty bad. But um, I was doing some uh, some research, like we do, because we're professionals here. Arbitrary endpoint time. And uh, I decided to, yeah, arbitrary endpoint it. And uh, since June 28th, uh, in 24 innings, Ibar has allowed 16 hits, struck out 34 guys, and uh, has an ERA of like 219. Uh, whip is under one, or around one. And, if, and then I, even I uh, decided to be even more arbitrary than that. From June 28th to August 5th, a uh, stretch of 18.2 innings, uh, nine hits allowed, nine walks, 29 strikeouts, uh, pony batting average 141 and 188 slugging, which means he basically gave up only singles. Mm-hmm. So it seems like something might have clicked. And I mean, we the stuff, even the reports I've gotten from people who've seen it, like the stuff is still crazy good. It's just the secondaries are really inconsistent. The command is awful. Command and control is not there. But if he's starting to harness that a little, which I mean, it's understandable given how recent his conversion is. The arm is electric. Like we've seen, you know, what hard throwing lefties can do. So it's interesting that they gave him the promotion. They clearly, he's clearly shown enough to them to get bumped up. And I assume he'll probably head back to instructs this year to keep getting work. But yeah, yeah, it's just interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is, it is very interesting. Um, you know, it's it, it, that kind of arm. That's a speaking of interesting rule five decisions. I mean, that's a guy who could get popped. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. That's a good point. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, we'll uh, see. I mean, especially if he's thrown, if he's got command now. Um, I think he's he's got to be Rule 5 eligible, right? He is. I just looked, yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about that this off season. Um Let's get to Portland really quick, Ian. I'll let you take the lead on this, and I'll chime in with my notes maybe. That sound like Sounds a plan? good. Oh, yeah, you saw Portland too. I forgot about that. Yep. Um, yeah, I saw them in New Hampshire against uh, – New Hampshire. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And uh, Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I guess. Do you want to start with Mata or Duran? I was just going to say like the hitters in general. It's not a very good team. I'll just be honest. Well, I liked Duran. What did you think of Duran? Yeah, I liked him. He was good. That was your first time seeing him this year. Yeah. I mean, he's the only guy on that team who can hit. So yeah. Wow. um, Wow. Well, okay. So by the time you saw them, Chatham was gone. I didn't, neither of us saw Dahlbeck. Yeah, everyone's gone. Like they got one hit and won a game in one of the days I was there, and then I think they had how many <laughs> they had like three hits the day before. So, yeah. or no, they had they had more than that. They probably had like six. But um, Duran, uh, yeah, I mean, I like he, he can hit. Um, there's no power at all. Like that's just not a part of his game. But I like his swing. Uh, the speed plays. Like he's not as fast as uh, Gilberto, but he's fast. Mm-hmm. Um, but he like. I like what he's doing at the plate in the sense that uh, he's starting to use all fields, which is something that he's like more of a, he's got more of like a normal swing than Gilberto just trying to slap. He's like a yeah. slap go guy. Yeah. Duran actually like tries to hit, um, like tries to pull the ball, like, you know, hit the ball hard. And um, he had, a, but he's also starting to go the other way also. And, but it's with authority. So like he had a really good, my favorite bat of the set I saw, I think I saw like eight at bats or nine at bats mm-hmm. was um, he got like a fastball way. It was like two strikes and he just stayed back and went with it like line drive, double to uh, left field right down the line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was a pitch that like someone with his speed might try to just like poke down like a little hit, hit a cheap little ground ball to the left side, just try to beat it out or, alternatively if they're trying to pull the ball just roll it over but he just kept his hands back and just was very content to just you know throw the barrel at it and go with it which was mm-hmm. a good piece of hitting yeah, yeah. he did he did that too and in, in, in the series i saw in Bowie, he had a couple of sing he had a single to left in his first at bat the second game that he you know was well hit but then in the second inning he did the same thing but when the fielder bobbled it it was kind of like a hilberto type play where when he saw the bobble he went, you know, took the extra base and turned it into a, a double. I mean, it was. I don't, I don't think they ruled it an error. It wasn't quite an error. Yeah. It was just not fielded as cleanly as it could have been. And he made it so, you know, like the Casas play, he had to slide that I was just talking about. But Duran got in standing up, and it wasn't even close when it probably should have been. Yeah, and like he had, um, he had one. I think like his speed is obviously going to play, and that's his biggest weapon. Um, but he kind of showed it in the second game where. He walked to lead off the game, and this was an inning where Portland scored two runs on no hits. But um, he, he walked, uh, stole second, 
Um, no, no hits. Um, but they, they, they had two runs in that inning without a hit. Um, oh, oh, inning. I thought you said game. Yeah. No, no. Okay. In that inning, uh, he walked, stole second, like easily wasn't even cl- like the guy. I don't think the catcher even made a throw cause he had such a good jump. Yep. Got to third. I want to say on, oh, he, he walked. And so his base is loaded. And then, um, there was a pass ball that was like barely past the catcher and he just went, it like just trickled off the dirt and he beat it easily. Not easily, but it was a, he, he got home on it. And it was one of those balls that like, you only go if you're super fast and right. very aggressive and like read the game really well. And right. it was just, yep. yeah. And, and he was just one of those things like, all right, that's like, that's what he should be doing with his speed. Like, yep. you know, putting pressure on the defense, forcing them to make mistakes. And that's kind of what he can do. And that's why, even though he doesn't have power, I still think there's a chance that he could be like a fringy everyday guy because of the speed. And like defensively, I didn't get to see a lot. Honestly, I don't remember like a single yeah. ball being hit to him over the multiple games I was there. But yeah. so that's, that's a Same. question because he needs to stick in center field for it to be valuable or mm-hmm. he's much more valuable if he can play center. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's like a, if, if you want to dream on it, it's like, you know, a top of the order, like actually, frankly, in this day and age, maybe it's not a top of the order, but like it's someone who, you know, kind of can get on base, good on decent on base skills, uh, hit for contact, slow slugging walls below, but he'll get, you know, fair share of extra base hits by his speed. And then, you know, hopefully steals 30 plus bases a year. Or so, and at worst, I mean, you're looking at, it's a very easy to shoehorn him in as like a bench profile because he can pinch run and he'll be able to play all, you can stick him in any of the outfield positions. I, if, if that's his ultimate goal, I wouldn't be surprised if they give him a second base club just a little bit to see. Yeah. I don't love the, I don't love the arm for right. But yeah, no, but it's a bench role you can take. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But um, it's just like a versatility thing. So yeah, no, you see, he's like a good prospect. Um, yeah, I, to me, I don't. It's not huge, but yeah. I think he's a nice player. I think he's a guy that, in best case scenario, he becomes a regular who hits seventh, eighth in your seventh, eighth or ninth in your lineup. Yeah, but like, say, isn't a whole like isn't like auto out at ninth in the order. No, he's someone who like he's going to hit like can keep eight. the lineup turning like a more consistent like you know Jackie Bradley hits back there because like sometimes he's an automatic out and sometimes he's the best hitter in the lineup right yeah, like, Bradley's way more power though too he does but I'm just oh, yeah I mean I'm not saying the comp I don't like the comp on their offensive games at all so don't yeah. get me wrong thank you for pointing that out what I'm saying more is like you hit him there because he'll be a little more steady but he's not going to be as impressive when as Bradley gets when he's impressive yeah does that make sense yeah he's someone like yeah. you can see like he'll slash like you know 280 330 280 280 to 300 like no 280 about like average hit tool that I think seems a bit 280 is not an average hit tool whatever above, 280 uh, is like a 60 hit tool no it's not I'm, I'm looking at it right now 275 to two yeah i guess it is above average uh it's plus um <laughs> i was gonna say uh, 260 whatever. yeah okay so i think you hit like 260 to 250 to 270 no like yeah i, I, could see I mean in a best case scenario 280 or but it's or like but it's shorter. like but it's like, you know, the OBP is like 330 and then he slugs like 410. Right. Like, it's not going to be a big slug guy. So. Right. Yeah, it's right. a nice player. But, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I, I still think there's a, there's a possibility he's the replacement for Jackie Bradley in 2021. I think it's possible. I'm not closing it's the possible. door on that. Yeah. I mean, it depends what route they go this offseason. I think we're going to see it. We'll know that's, a lot more fair. depending on what happens with Mookie Betts. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, okay, so we've got, I mean, anybody else in the lineup that we should I mean, Brett Netzer. Mention, he's, yeah, he's, Netzer. He's tr- he, he walked a couple times. Oh, he had a Wilson couple of hits. Too. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, I don't know. He, like, he, he tried. He's getting shifted to pole. Yeah, Netzer just, like, he's clear. He changed his swing a little bit. He's, like, more uppercut trying to try the ball more. Yep. Yep. But the problem I have is, like, even when he squares it up, it's like he, he hits it with top spin, so it just doesn't carry at all. Well, so. Kevin Thomas wrote something the other day about how he's kind of given up on the trying to li- lift everything and that yeah. he's been hitting better of late because he stopped trying to do that. Yeah, um, so I, I, I don't love the swing. Um, like, he's just a fringy guy to me. Like yeah. The, the, the double the, I saw was 90 miles per hour off the uh, – oh, no, the pitch was 90. Sorry, never mind. The bat just doesn't – I don't think there's enough in the bat to profile. Yeah. Single to right field, It's I noted that it was a very linear swing. Just like it's – Yeah, so I don't know. I'm not a huge, I, I'm not a huge fan. Um, Marcus Wilson. Looks, right, looks I, the part. Yeah, he's, like, super athletic. Like, mm-hmm. it's a great frame. He's got bat speed. Um I think a swing can get long, and 
it, they're just the feel and approach is just very like raw still. Yeah. Um, like the raw tools are really exciting, but the other, like the more like, you know, detailed oriented parts of the game are just not there yet. And I saw him make a few shaky plays in the outfield. Um, yeah. He was busy. Like, and you know how you like the thing with, you know, with, with fielders, it's like when you don't notice them, it's either because they're just an average fielder and they didn't stand out as being particularly bad or good. Like Cole Brandon stood out to me because he was flying all over the place in center, right? Whereas yeah. he also stood out to me in that he deferred on a ball that he should have caught to Suarez because Suarez has the far superior arm. Um, but, you know, Duran I didn't really notice. Wilson I noticed in part because he was busy and in part because he had a few misplays that were kind of, yeah. Um, but he does have a very strong arm. Strength on the arm, I'd probably call it 55 or 60. The accuracy needs to be better. Um, I noted because he had a couple. Th- he had one throw where he tried to throw a guy out at third, and he just threw it about five feet over the third baseman's head, um, and wound up giving the guy home when he maybe shouldn't have even been trying to make the play at third. Um, but yeah, he definitely looks the part. He's got some loft in the swing. I think if he starts making a little more contact, that would be good. I don't know if that squares with what you saw, but um, yeah, I just like Wilson. There's just so much swing and miss in his game. It's hard to like. Yeah, the raw tools are there. I'm just not sure he's going to hit. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the pitchers. Let's talk about Brian Mata. Uh, yeah. So I saw him. He started. And <laughs> Should, we start he with a... me? <laughs> Should we start with me seeing him? My uh, one inning? No, because you didn't see him, so we don't need to talk about what you he saw. He threw 28 pitches. It doesn't matter. I don't inning. care what you had to say. Um, <laughs> you didn't see an out. It doesn't count as an outing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Mata's Mata's overall line in the game I saw was not very – it was like, all right, it was six innings, seven hits, four Mm -hmm. earned runs, two walks, seven strikeouts. But that kind of doesn't really like like show what actually happened because he had one bad inning. And then if you take that inning out, he threw like five shutout innings with two hits that were both infield and singles. And I don't Mm -hmm. think he walked a guy and he struck out like six guys. Mm -hmm. So he had one bad inning. Um, which is, I, I don't know if that's been kind of the story with Portland, but he's been pretty inconsistent since he got there. Between but us, like, we've only seen two bad innings. Yeah, but, like, the raw stuff is still there. Like, it's much better than it used to be. He was, um, like, 95 to 96 for the majority of the game. Like, even in the sixth inning, he was still sitting in, like, the mid-90s um, with, like, heavy sink on his fastball. He couldn't command it at all, but... I mean, it, it's like the raw stuff that if he can even get to below average command, it'll play in a rotation. Um, he threw all of the secondary pitches. Like, I liked uh, his slider. I guess it's a slide. I don't know what it is. I it's, think it's a cutter. It's high not high eighties. No, like I, I, I trackman wise, it's a slider, but. I don't know. Who cares what track man? I don't care about the um, computer. Says. So I don't know what it is. It's a slider cutter, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes it looks more like a slider. Sometimes it looks more like a cutter to me. Yeah. So, um, but I think it's a plus to better pitch. Like it was nasty. He threw some disgusting ones that hitters had absolutely no chance on. Yeah. Like he, I think he broke like five bats in the game too. Like he was just mowing down the hands of lefties with it. And it's a legit out pitch. Like that's big league quality. Like if it doesn't work as a for starter, a pitch he's been throwing for less than a year. Yeah, it's like if for even if it doesn't work as a starter, that's like a devastating secondary out of the bullpen. So I think he has a chance to start though, but we'll get mm-hmm. on to that in a second. Um, but yeah, that pitch he got a bunch of swing and misses on it, like two, four. He got like seven or eight swing and misses. I don't want to have to count right now. But um, yeah, it was just a really good pitch. Uh, like short horizontal, um, like boring movement. Um, it looks like a fastball until late, and then it just dives right in yep. on the hands of lefties. Like it's a really good pitch. Um, he also threw a curveball, uh, like seventy nine to eighty one, and I thought I called it average. Like yeah. that's what I got. It was fine. It. Like it, he sequenced it well. He was able to like backdoor to lefties, which I liked. But it's just an interesting pitch given his arm slot because he's kind of, he's like three quarters, but it's like. It's not low three quarters, but it's not three quarters. I don't know. It's like three eighths. <laughs> I don't know. Are you his saying it's slot. lower than three quarters? Yeah, it's, yeah, but it's not low three quarters. It's like right. Okay. Know, his, his on the slot. low side of three quarters. Yeah. So that? yeah. So so it's interesting <laughs> that he throws a curveball from that slot because um or I guess it would have been uh, yeah but uh, I guess it's like it's like eleven to five ten to four almost yeah no but it's just like a weird slot for a curveball because you can't really get on top of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it works for him and it's got like, I liked it's like shape. Um, he get on the side of it, which is understandable given the slot and it can get a little slurvy, but I thought it was pretty good, like average pitch. And, um, 
then he also threw some change-ups at like 85 to 89 um, most were like 86, 87. And I, I think it's like a fringy pitch. I'm not a huge fan of it. It's on the firm side to me, pretty inconsistent. He threw a couple with good arm speed that were like maybe average, but then he threw some other ones that weren't good that were like, you know, 35, forties. So I think it eventually develops into like a fringy pitch. Um, but you know, when you're talking about like a 65 fastball, 60 secondary, like 60 slider, 50 curveball, that's like three average yep. to better pitches. That's the starting profile. And he's definitely, his deliveries improved. Um, it's still there's still some effort, but it's it's much better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. He uses he gets his lower half into it more. Good body, and yeah, the body is like he's he's not as uh, he, he got a little soft a couple years ago uh, body wise. He's kind of it seems like he's gotten in better shape. Well, because he he grew like two inches or three inches last well, yeah, year. Him being listed at 160 pounds is a joke. Yeah, he's like, I mean he he's, but, he's he yeah, but that's what happened is he grew. And I think last year was when they weren't thrilled with his conditioning. Yeah, he's probably like 6'4", 230 would be my guess. Yeah, and now but, he looks like, I mean, it's broad shoulders. I was sitting right behind him when they were charting. He's like, it's a starting pitcher's build. Yes. And, like, the yeah, the delivery works enough, like, that with his pitch mix, because, like, even his changeup, like, it's a fringy pitch, it's still something that I think you can throw in a major league game when he comes correctly. Yeah, definitely. So if you have four pitches that you can throw in a major league game, like, you have to give him a chance to start. And like, I don't really care about his numbers. They're not good. But what I'm looking at, like in Portland is he's, he's, you know, 48 strikeouts in 40 innings. He's missing bats at the double a level. The walks are too high, obviously, which is something, as I said, the command and control needs improvement. He's Mm -hmm. given up a few too many hits, but I wonder like in the game, I saw a lot of the hits he gave up were like just weak contact singles. Um, he gave up a cut, one home run, which was just a terrible pitch where he just, I think it was a fastball. Yeah, it was a fastball that he just left up. And when he, when he loses fastball up, it's hittable. But it's, yeah. that's one of those things that like, if he tightens up the command, it won't be as big an issue. And so I like him. I think he's the number two prospect in the system. Yeah. Um, Agreed. I think that if everything breaks right, you're talking about like a number three, number four starter. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, who knows like where the stuff, like the fact that his stuff continues to improve year on year, just, you, you never know. So I, yeah. I think he's he's good. I don't really care about how bad his numbers are. And I think there's like, if for some reason he doesn't start, it's potentially like a late inning bullpen profile because of the fastball slider combo. Okay. So hmm. yeah, but so I, I think he's can start though. And I think he, yeah, he's by far the best starting pitching prospect in the system until Jake room shows me he can pitch a hundred innings in a year. Right. Uh, three quick points. One, just because we alluded to the game I saw, he faced five hitters. They all got hits. Uh, the leadoff hitters hit was kind of garbage single to the first base on a ground ball, but the rest of them were well hit. Um, that was three three balls in a row went to Marcus Wilson in right field, um, and then a, the four, the fifth hitter had a single through the left side, and he was done after 28 pitches. Um, his velo was down to start that game, so it was like 91 to 93 before, and there was a mound visit, and then in his last two hitters, he was back up to 95, 96. So I'm wondering if there was something going on mechanically. He's also about 20 innings over what, what he's thrown in any year prior. Like his previous career high in innings thrown was that innings pitched was in the seventies and he's in the high nineties at this point. He's going to pass a hundred. That's good though. He should be. That's like right. I would say he's probably going to get cut off. I don't think he's going to go to the fall league. Or that's, well, that's, that was the second point I was going to make. There's no chance he pitches in the fall league because he no. needs a, he needs an off season. Because he, if he's at seventy this year, he's going to make one two more starts this year probably because I think he's pitching today. Oh no, he got skipped already. Oh, they skipped his last start because he hasn't pitched since the 16th. I'm looking at it right now. Unless MILB is wrong. I don't think that's true. Well, MILB doesn't have him pitching since the 16th. Really? So, huh. yeah. Maybe they did skip him. So they might have skipped Could him already. It makes sense because he's at 92 innings. Yeah, and if he gets two more in starts. his previous career high is 77. Is, yeah, which, you know, give him two more starts, gives him 25 more innings than the previous year, which is about right. So I could see them bringing him to instructs and having him throw a couple – three inning games and instructs or something, no, but they don't, they're not they don't sending do, him to the fall league. They don't usually have double. Or they'll probably instructs. bring him in to do the, the, the strength, strength and conditioning. conditioning. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's like a good year for Mata. It's encouraging. Um, I'm interested to see, you know, like he's still young for the level, which is the other thing. Like we're talking about a 20 year old with this stuff in double A. So it's still crazy to think how young. Well, and the third point I wanted to make that kind of leads to that is just, I don't see any chances in the majors next year. You, unless he absolutely just, no, Dunks I mean, um, on everybody. Unless, well, the only way would be like if they decide to go the route that like some teams like the Dodgers are doing, like Dustin May, where they want to bring him in as like a bullpen role later in the year. 
But, Either that or just give him a spot start or two, figuring – like if I he – he starts next year in Portland unless he just no, balls he starts, out. It doesn't matter. He's starting in Portland next year. Yeah. I don't think there's any way he starts in Pawtucket. Yeah, so you start him in Portland because you're going to need to put some depth in Pawtucket anyway. He's going to pitch like – if he throws well, throw like 60 innings, get promoted around the all-star break. If that. Throw another 40, 50 in Pawtucket. And if he's super good and you're in contention and you think he could be a relief help, you maybe call him up just for his last, you know, 15 innings. And if or he not, gets a spot start or two. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think he's an answer for them next year. Um, maybe 2021 if, if everything breaks perfectly. Um, we got an email in from Jake. Uh, and Jake says, uh, hi, guys, uh, talk to me about Daniel McGrath. I've seen him three times now this year in Portland, and he's having a ridiculous year. From what I've seen, the delivery makes him very deceptive, and the slider looks good. I haven't seen much hard contact off him at all. What's the future look like for him? Thanks, guys. Love the pod and the website. Keep up the good work, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Ian, you saw Daniel McGrath. What did you think of him? Because I didn't get to see him. So I agree uh, with what Jake, Jake, I don't know if you've seen Portland or, but uh, you're very perceptive with he's your uh, breakdown. Three time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three times Cause McGrath is super deceptive. That's, and that's kind of how he gets by. And unfortunately that's what concerns me. Um, cause, cause I don't know if that's going to play against more advanced hitters. Like his stuff is still just, it's very fringy. Um, his fastball was 80 and I saw him go seven innings, four hits, one earned run, no walks, eight strikeouts. So I saw a good, good outing. And I think all like three of the four hits were infield singles. Right. So he was 86 to 88 topped out at 89, like a few times, but it was 86 to 88. Um, he used all four quadrants. Uh, the fastball got on hitters really quick. He's got um, he's got decent extension. Um, average, like average above average command. I mean, control like fringy command. But yeah, he just does a good job like locating his fa- or using like moving his fastball around the zone and like sequencing it well. And um, he got like eighteen or nineteen swinging strikes with all his pitches in this outing. So like he was missing bats, but. Um, but yeah, as as uh, what Jake is that his name? Yes, Jake said it, it's just all deception. Like he's got this long arm action with this like stab hitch behind, but and then he, when he brings the ball forward, he just keeps it like you cannot see it until very late. And with his extension, by the time he's releasing it, he's pretty close. He's getting a lot closer to home plate, so the ball just like it looks faster than how hard he's throwing. Mm-hmm. And that can play against like double A hitters, but guys, as we saw, like he got promoted for one triple A start and he got bombed. Like, against more advanced hitters, that just doesn't work as well. And the other issue for me is, like, his secondary pitches, like, they're fine, but I didn't, I think they're, like, all, like, 45 to 50s. Like, I just didn't see any, like, an above average secondary pitch. Like, his changeup was 78 to 80. Um, he's got good feel for it, like, good arm speed. He can pull the string on it. I thought that, I, that was my favorite of his secondary pitches. Curveball is, like, 71 to 75. Um, kind of a change of pace pitch, like a show me breaking ball, you know, it was used best when sequenced. Um, it was like a little loose for me. Like he got some swinging strikes with it, but it was something that I just can't see like big league hitters expanding the zone against. And then the slider was like 78 to 80 also a little more horizontal and longer than the curveball, But, um, yeah, I mean, he, and he hung a few and he actually didn't throw it very much. Frankly, in the game I saw it was mostly curveballs and changeups. And like I, yeah, I mean the outing was really good. The numbers are insane in Double A, but I just, I don't know how many there aren't very many guys in the big leagues this year who top out at eighty eight and are successful or top out at eighty nine. And I know being a lefty gives him a better chance, so maybe he could have like a career like we've seen with like Robbie Scott, you know, where he comes up, has some success, getting by but by deception, but then when the book goes out, you're kind of toast, and then you get in the DFA bandwagon, and you know you're on a bunch of different orgs. But I just like. I don't really see much upside here and I don't. Yeah. You know, you know, it doesn't sound like you're super in on him. No, I mean, I, it's a great story and I hope he succeeds. I hope he has a, you know, I hope he can get up there and maybe something clicks, you know, in kind of like a bullpen role, but I just don't see the stuff to start. Where'd you say the, say the arm slot is now? It's like three quarters, three quarters on McGrath. Cause I mean, he last year, I think it was, didn't he like drop down? He tried side arming. Maybe been two years ago or okay. it, was, it was either last year. Or two I think because ago. last year was when he pitched out of the bullpen really for the first time too. So. Mm, he started last year for 11. He had 11. Starts. Right. But then he moved into the bullpen. That was oh, okay. his first time pitching full time in a bullpen role. Gotcha. And then this so, year he was like kind of started in the bullpen and then sort of was like moving into a swingman role and then started 
I mean, he's re- he's been really good, and like I see why he gets out at Double A, but I'm just I. It's hard for me to go above like an emergency profile with him. I just don't think the stuff is there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I saw Denny Reyes. Let me talk about him really quick. Uh, four pitches. I saw him go seven innings. If you look at the line, it's kind of the opposite of Mata, where it's a great line. A lot of loud outs uh, to the outfield. I mean, if you look at first inning, F9, F9, F9. Um, had a fly out to center in the second. Had a fly out to left in the third. Um, the two well-hit fly outs to left in the fourth. Um, fifth inning, he kept everything on the ground. Sixth inning, um, ground ball, K, long K, uh, bat that ended in a K swinging. Single up the middle, caught stealing to end the inning. And then his last inning, long fly outs to left, center, and left. Um, a lot of well-hit balls to the outfield. Uh, the fastball, so this was tough. I was looking at a gun that was slow. So I had him like 86 to 89. He was probably more 88 to 91, um, knowing what I know now about the gun I was looking at. Um, liked the change up, which showed some drop. I had that like, did I wind up doing a chart on him? I hope I did because looking at this big old, uh, whatever. Uh, this is compelling audio. Okay, here we go. Oh, I did do one. All right, yeah, so the change-up was, like, low 80s. So I had, like, 80, 81, so that's probably, like, 82 to 83. Slider was about the same band, and then the curveball was adjusting for the gun anywhere from, like, 73 to 78. Um, You know, the curveball is a big breaker. It's kind of sweepy. It changes shape. I don't know if that's on purpose or not. It definitely could be. Um, slider is a lot more, it's a lot shorter, 11 to five, probably the fourth pitch for him, in my opinion. Um, he was comfortable throwing the curveball, you know, three, four times in an at bat. Same thing with the change up, really comfortable throwing that pitch too. Um, he'd worked the slider in as well. Um, he kind of showed like, a, like it kind of showed as a cutter. Sometimes he'd throw it like 86. Uh, he tr- just kind of cut it a little bit rather than, than throw a true slider. <sighs> It's deception. I mean, I, I'm going to need to see it at the upper. It's not a starter in the major leagues. He just gives up way too much loud contact that with the AAA slash MLB baseball is it, just going to fly. I think there's – I could see them trying to move him before he gets up to AAA, honestly, to see if a team really likes the stuff before he just starts – you know, before those fly balls turn into home runs with the major league baseball. Um, if he does get to the majors, I think he's probably a long reliever. Uh, but he was interesting. Um, did you see Edward Bizzardo, Ian? Yeah, I did. I liked him. Um, uh, yeah. I what was he for like you? 92, 93. Yeah, that's kind of what I had. I had him 91 to 93, which – or 191 to 92, touching 94. So that's really more 92 to 90 – 91 to 93, touching 95, 96 maybe. Yeah. I mean, um, it's not like a late-inning guy. I think he's like a fifth, sixth-inning, like middle relief yeah, type. Yeah, curveball, but... low 80s, slider, mid-80s. Splitter, high 80s. Yeah, splitter was like 87. Curveball, mm-hmm. slider were like 79 to 83. They more or less ran into each other. But the curveball, slider, the breaking ball, he's got he, his spin rate is really good. Like he really snaps it off. And you can just tell when you see it. Like yeah, there's a it lot works. of it's good shape. Um, he's got feel for it, threw it a ton. I like the curveball a lot. I think it's like a potential plus pitch. Okay. So yeah, but like. I just don't think there's a lot of upside, though. You Did know? he it's pitch like, backwards for you? Because I'd be, it would be interested to see them doing something with him like they do with Yohan Martinez where he throws the curveball, 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 busts the fastball up and in, you uh, know, for a swing and strike. Let's a look. Let's see. Because for me, he was mostly fastballs. Um, he threw very few. I mean, this. No, he's like fastball. I mean, he threw first at bat, fastball, curveball, fastball, second at bat, curveball, curveball, fastball, fastball. Okay, curveball. see, he wasn't doing that for me. Then next at bat, fastball, fastball, curveball, 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 fastball. So he was like a little of both. Okay, yeah. So he was throwing the curveball a lot more for you than for me. Uh, But I also called like the curveball and the slider the same thing. So some of those were sliders, but whatever. Um, And then, yeah. So he was good. I I think he's like a potential like fifth, sixth inning guy. It's not a high ceiling. He's a, you know, worst case, he's an org arm. So he's probably good. One more pitcher worth mentioning? Um. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I'll mention it. <laughs> Came out of nowhere. I'm going to go rapid fire on a few. Okay. Um, 
I saw Edgar Jimenez in okay. the bullpen oh, wow. as the How'd closer. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, he was 91 to 93, uh, slider 83 to 84. Just it was huh. cool seeing him in the bullpen. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Jordan Weems, 95 to 97 out of the bullpen. Um, command still inconsistent. Splitter, like 88, 89. Slider, 87 to 90. It's a really good arm. I just don't know if the command and the secondaries will ever be consistent enough to be a big league like option. Yep. But the stuff is impressive. Um, and speaking of impressive stuff, the other guy is some guy I'd never heard of, but <laughs> uh, Robinson Lair. Lair? Yeah. I don't know. Lair, yeah. Uh, he was 97 to 99 with every single pitch. And I think only one of them was 97. The majority were 98 or 99. Really? Okay. Uh, Cause when I saw him, he came in after Mata in the first. So I think he might've been holding back a little bit because yeah. he, knew he was going to have to give them some length. So yeah, he was 97 to 99. Um, he had no idea where it was going, even though he stuck <laughs> out three guys and walked one, but I'm looking at his game log. Like he walked three guys, like two outings later. Mm-hmm. So it's just no command and control. The delivery is like a 20 delivery. Like it's max effort to the yeah. extreme. Um, but the fastball is just the velocity is incredibly, his arm is so quick and his velocity the get that he gets is incredible. And his slider was like 85 to 87. He threw some really good ones. But I guess it's just like super inconsistent, which would explain why he's been on, you know, this is with the Red Sox are his third order of the year. And right. even with that velocity, you know, he's got 23 strikeouts in 19 innings, but he's also walked 16 guys. So right. it's a really strong arm, but the command and control and the delivery plus his age, I just, yeah, it's probably like there's a reason he's been in a bunch of orgs. So, yeah. Um, the other one guy I just mentioned, I saw Matthew Gorst. I only marked down that the cutter was like 88, 89, which was probably more like 90, 91. He's, he is what he is. I mean, he's an up and down double A, triple A guy at this point, it looks like. Um, but yeah, all right. So that's Portland. Um, Ian, let's throw it to the Mike Rickard interview. And then we'll come back really quick with a couple minutes of, uh, of final thoughts. Sound good? All right, here's uh, my interview from earlier this week with Red Sox VP of Amateur Scouting, Mike Rickard. We talked about a lot of stuff. 2019 draft class, scouting generally. Um, yeah, a lot of good stuff in here, so uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys enjoy it. We'll be back on the other side to uh, give our quick thoughts on it and wrap up. All right, well, now we are pleased to be joined, as always, by our friend and, and, and uh, follow, guy we've been, whose work we've been following for years now, Mike Rickard, a VP of Amateur Scouting for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Mike, it's always a pleasure to get on the horn with you. I'm glad we were able to make this work out. Uh, I know you're a busy guy, uh, year round people, you know, I said this last time you were on, I think people don't understand that like draft scouting and amateur scouting is not a February through June business. And so I know we're, we're kind of past the, you know, the June draft for 2019, we're past the signing deadline and all of that, but I know you're still busy, uh, doing showcases and all kinds of scouting for, for next year's class. Um, so thanks for taking the time out uh, to chat with us today. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and always enjoy speaking and spending time with you guys and uh, kind of sharing some of the some of the insights on our department or profession. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely I think it's something that people don't really appreciate you know i think people they see the guys come in the system and they assume you know if a guy gets to the majors it's player dev and not just you know and not uh scouting or you know maybe they overlook scouting player dev in favor of scouting but that's why we like to make sure we get the full picture here and um i I mean i guess at this time of year you know we've got a little bit of a sample size i guess the thing we could probably jump right into looking at uh, and the thing that I bet a lot of the folks who are listening to the show um, want to hear about is this class. Uh, both Ian and I have been on the record that we think it, it looks like another dynamite class, another well-rounded class with a bunch of interesting guys up and down. And, and I guess just to start with, you know, I think we might have touched on this a little bit the first time we had you on, but it was so far off we didn't get too far into it. Knowing that you guys were coming in, not at a disadvantage, but you know, you had kind of this, you had the smallest bonus pool of any team picking in in large part, uh, because, well, you know, the team won the world series last year and was picking last, uh, but also in large part because of going over the 
third tier of the competitive balance tax, moved the first round pick back 10 spots to number 43. It seemed like to come up with another great crop of guys entering the system, you're going to potentially have to get a little creative. And, you know, we've talked about the way that you guys did that a little bit, but was that something that you guys were looking any more to do? Or was that just kind of look by hook or by crook, we're going to get the best talent into the system however we can with the you know, with the resources we've got. And if we're getting creative, great. If we're not, we'll do that too. Yeah. I think you always kind of want to remain constant and thinking creatively. Um, you know, each draft class kind of presents a different, um, you know, diff- different depths and different demographic strengths and demographics. And, you know, we, we're constantly encouraging our scouts and our, you know, our staff to always, always think creatively and um, what you try to do. So probably more importantly than that is just work each day to, to get the best coverage that you can. We're fortunate enough to have a big staff and a group of guys that have been together for a long time. So we work, we work cohesively with each other and, you know, the way that we kind of communicate to kind of maintain you know, quality each day and, and branching out to get coverage. I think the kind of culmination of all those things allows you to, to, to really be able to recognize, you know, the most amount of good players. And then when you sit down in May and start lining up your draft board, it's always helpful to have, you know, numerous reports on, you're always going to, you're always going to have, plenty of looks on all the top guys, you know, say your top 100 or how you ever, Mm -hmm. however you decide to line up your draft board, but where you can really kind of find competitive advantages is as the draft progresses and you get into the seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th rounds. And you can, you can point to people in the room that not only have seen those players, you know, whether it's a Jaron Duran or, um, Thad Ward or Chris Murphy or those type guys that, you know, not only have seen, have been seen by the scout, the cross checker, you know, maybe in, maybe a special assignment scout or those type things that have convictions in the room. Um, like a couple of the great stories that I have, if I can brag on Chris Mears, who's our <laughs> pitching, um, cross checker now is, you know, last year in the draft room and Chris is a pretty, stoic guy like he's one of those type people that when he speaks you really pay attention because it's going to be a well thought out kind of comment and last year during the draft he kind of stood up and said listen the the draft was progressing we're in the fourth round or whatever and he's he's kind of puts out the reminder like you know hey rick please don't lose that ward i really want to make sure we get this guy and then obviously he's kind of on his way to Mm -hmm. evolving into a really good prospect. And then this year it was kind of the same thing. He kind of stood up or spoke up and, you know, said, Hey, let's make sure we get Chris Murphy. I just have a special feeling about him. And, you know, again, very, very early in his case, but I will say that he's been very impressive so far and looks like a, you know, looks like another legitimate prospect. So those are the kind of things we try to do. It all really goes back to the area scout and they're kind of the ones that position us to, you know, to recognize these talents and, and the better area scouts are the ones that are kind of more aggressive and their, you know, their um, kind of pursuits of getting their guys seen. But, um, you know, we work, we work hard, very hard daily to get out and really get coverage and, kind of make sure that we see as many of these guys that our area scouts like as possible. And that, that in the end is where you can really kind of make a difference a little bit deeper in the draft. Mm-hmm. And the, the, you, what you said there brought up a couple of things that I was wanting to ask you about. One thing that I guess really quick, you know, you mentioned Thad Ward, who we've talked about, you know, all season as, as one of the, you know, breakout prospects in the system this year. Um, he's a guy who, wasn't even ranked in, you know, for example, Baseball America's top 500 last year. And I guess the reason I don't mean that to, you know, to throw shade at BA, they did, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't even know how they get info on this many guys with the staff they've got. But just with, with what you're, you mentioned lining up the draft board. Uh, roughly, do you think how close is what you guys line up on a draft board to what 
those of us who aren't in you know a major league draft war room are looking at with publicly available data do you think that you know it may, maybe near the top obviously it might be closer but just how far apart do you think that winds up being from what we're working with um you know in june versus what you guys are looking at in the war room as far as the variance and what our actual draft board looks like, yeah, and like how most of the media and publications and prognosticators, yeah, and, yeah. So like, yeah, you know, because the the thing is, we'll look at you know, we'll look at a guy and say, oh well, he's ranked here, here, and here by these publications. Why didn't they sign him? Or you know, this guy's ranked here, here, and here. Why didn't they pick him ahead of this guy who's ranked here, here, and here? You know, do you, do you, yep. how close do you think that gets? Very far. Um, and like that word's a great example. But, and, and the reasoning is that it's very hard. Like, mm-hmm. I think that the, the publications and the people that invest so much time and effort into kind of trying to figure out, um, you know, where teams, you know, who, who teams are prioritizing and those type things. It's, I think they're pretty accurate at the top of the draft, maybe in the top 50 picks or that type thing. But as, as you move past that, it really spreads out because it's so subjective what we do. I mean, one right. team every year, you know, there'll be guys that go in the, you know, second round that we have in the eighth round. And mm-hmm. that's, that's fine with me because, I mean, most importantly, like we're trusting our scouts, but two, there's, there's just, there's, there's so many, it's really so subjective in how different teams view, you know, view players. And, Quite honestly, in many cases, there's very little difference in, you know, maybe a second rounder and, and an eighth rounder, so to speak. So it's mm-hmm. it's got to be a big challenge for a lot of these publications and media outlets to kind of kind of make these um, predictions when they don't have a full scouting staff in place. And um, there's many examples you can go back and look through the years at guys that have gotten to the big leagues and you know, um, really emerged very quickly as top prospects that weren't even ranked in the, you know, in the top one, 150 of some of the prospect lists and so mm-hmm. forth. So it's tough. It's tough. It's always makes for interesting reading and um, all of those things. But um, I would say that our draft room in most years looks, you know, again, after the first 30, 40, mm-hmm. you know, guys on the board, it looks, I, w- I would imagine that it looks much different from other teams boards and as well as, you know, many of the, you know, draft projections and so mm-hmm. forth. Yeah. The prime example of that is the uh, sh- high school shortstop from Tennessee that you guys took in the fifth round in 2011, who wasn't ranked by anybody that that one seemed to turn out. Okay. So, yeah, correct. <laughs> correct. So, and there's been many others. I mean, right. I have many, many friends that work for a lot of those, um, you know, publications and so forth. And it's I always think to myself that I don't envy their jobs of having to put together a top 100 draft list on, you know, in December. <laughs> right. And the other thing, too, it's like, you know, people have those conversations on the top guys, but no, no, no team in baseball is going to alert a writer to a player that they think they can steal in the third or fourth round. They're mm-hmm. just, they're right. just not going to do it. So, um, you know, many times those guys, you know, kind of stay under the radar because teams are smart. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that makes sense. The other thing that you alluded to was something that I had wanted to ask about. And you mentioned that you guys have a scouting department that a lot of the guys that are there have been there for a while i mean you look at this year's first rounder um cameron cannon out of the university of arizona you know vaughn williams was also the guy who scouted and signed bobby dahlbeck you know these are these are guys who've been around you've got history with them you know what they're good at seeing what they you know the relationships they build um you know university of florida you know, you guys, uh, you know, Stephen Argent has, has gotten you, a, has signed a few guys out of Florida. Of course, it's it's UF, which helps. But, you know, it seems like there are guys who've been in, and those just happen to both be college program examples. But, you know, the continuity that you guys have had, I think we touched on it last time, but it seems like that continues to bear fruit for you guys. And just, you know, what are some of the ways that that does bear fruit? Is it, you know, developing relationships with programs, being able to get the coach to trust you and say, Hey, take another look at this guy. Or, you know, is it just that they're 
you know, they're around because they're good at what they do and, and that leads to them having the right eye for things, you know, is it a combination thereof? How does that play out for you guys with, with that kind of group that stays together? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, to the first part of that, um, having a scouting staff that's been together for quite a while, and we do, there's a lot of continuity that's, that, that, that does create, you know, an advantage because you get to know people and um, everyone has their own style of scouting. We have, we have all different types of scouts. And once you kind of figure out who that person is, it allows you to kind of make, make a better, better, um, you know, determination of what they mean when they talk about a certain type of player. And Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be amazed at like how many different types of scouts we have on our staff with just different styles. And we have some very conservative scouts and we have some very aggressive scouts. And, you know, we encourage that. Like we want you to kind of become who you are as an evaluator and find your own niche in, in scouting. But it does make it easier once you kind of get to know that person and know what they mean when they say a certain thing. So, um, you know, and then as far as kind of the draft room culture, it's also very important because we really encourage all of the people in the room and the cross checkers to, you know, to express their opinions and convictions openly and understand that they will never be hard feelings. And I can make, you know, I have to make a, uh, you know, a number of decisions on a daily basis in the draft room that at many times can be disappointing to some of the scouts that, you know, believe otherwise. But um, quite honestly, I don't think there's anyone in the room that ever worries about that type of thing. And there's a great understanding and each other that, you know, we all have big decisions to make. And once we move player A over player B, we move on to player C. And um, mm-hmm. that makes it a lot easier because, you know, these guys work work their tails off. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the board doesn't line up the way that they would they would want it. And, um, you know, so we, we do have a good, you know, mutual respect for each other. And, and all of our guys kind of get along and are pulling on the same end of the rope, which is nice. Um, in regards more specifically to the programs and so forth, I'll just say in general, we like players from really good programs. Mm -hmm. I don't think we would kind of, hopefully we wouldn't kind of overweight that variable or that part of the equation. Um, but it is important. It's always good to, you know, to know that a guy comes from a winning program and he understands the kind of the importance of the you know the attention to details that most most good players have and you know you get you get you, you kind of have much more of a comfort level that they know how to work and they've performed against good competition and that they've you know gone through a lot of the things that maybe players from other programs haven't so that's always comforting um, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that you know we would always kind of preference a player from a better program but if all things are equal it's certainly nice to um, you know, to get players that they come from the really good programs. And, you know, as far as our scouts go, I mean, that's one, one of the kind of top priorities of each of our scouts is they should, they should have good relationships and they should see those top programs a lot because, um, again, in general, like that's where, <laughs> that's where the good, you know, the good players are coming from and those programs that are pumping out you know, major league players year in and year out, you know, they they should be the experts on those players. Um, And you referenced the University of Florida and you can just go back through the years and look at, look at the success rates of players that have been taken out of there. It's, it's very good. And there's other Mm -hmm. schools that have been very good through the years and the results haven't been quite the same. And it's, it's challenging to kind of put a finger on exactly why, but, um, there are certain programs that have been very productive in producing major league players, and we pay, you know, we do pay special attention to those places. That makes sense. Um, and I know we don't have you forever, so I, I'm going to get screamed at by our listeners if I don't ask about a few of the guys that entered the system this year. And I guess we'll start uh, at the top with with the day one guys. A um, couple of infielders that you guys took. Uh, 
I guess technically both in the second round. I still don't know how to refer to, to whether Cameron Cannon is a first or second rounder. Um, but uh, Cameron Cannon out of the University of Arizona and uh, Puerto Rican high school shortstop Matthew Lugo. Um, both technically shortstops, but kind of different players. Um, you know, what did you guys see in those two? And, and what do you think, uh, you know, what should we be looking for with those guys moving forward? It seems like, uh, you know, Lugo's had a good start, uh, or at least uh, has gotten his feet under him after, you know, figuring things out maybe in, in the Gulf Coast League. And, and Cannon, of course, has been in Lowell, and we've, we've seen him up there. What would you guys see in those two guys? And, and, yeah, what do you think of them going forward? Yeah, so Cameron Cannon, we felt, was one of the um, – you know, one of the better college hitters in this draft. Um, kind of when we kind of put all the pieces of the puzzle together on a college hitter, he really kind of stood out in several ways. Um, um, you know, from an analytical perspective, he was a guy that struck out at a very low rate and while at the same time driving the ball. Uh, I think he broke the all time University of Arizona doubles record and did so with a a really kind of elite strikeout rate this year. Um, there were also some things, you know, obviously some real positives in regards to like his swing path and kind of his approach and those things um, that we really liked. And there were also some things that we noted a um, couple, couple kind of tweaks. You don't typically um, count on tweaks kind of coming, you know, taking place. But there are a couple things from a mechanical standpoint where we think we can help him moving forward. So um, all of those things were very intriguing and um, led to, a, you know, to an obvious very high level of interest that we had in him uh, from a defensive standpoint. We didn't have great convictions that he was a shortstop. We, we certainly think that the pieces are in place for him to – kind of work his way into being a more consistent shortstop. His his actions fit there. His mm-hmm. his hands are certainly, you know, hands and his arm are certainly good enough. He's had some stints through his career where he's made um made more errors probably than he he should have made and, you know, one of those things that it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but um, he's going to get plenty of opportunities to short to play shortstop and through time we hope to kind of figure out what the real, you know, real um, possibilities are that he'll be able to stay there on a regular basis. Uh, we do know that he's he's going to be a very good second baseman. If that doesn't work out, we've seen enough of him there and, um, you know, and, and are comfortable with that projection. He played third base in the Cape last year. And while we just had kind of bits and, you know, really glimpses of him there at third base. Um, it was reported to us that he did very well at third base. So there will be some defensive versatility, not too early to count out shortstop. And um, as we know with many guys like this, if he hits well enough, and um, then, uh, you know, it won't be as much of a concern as far as where he plays or profiles. So mm-hmm. um, in regards to Lugo, he's a <clears throat> he's a really exciting player that, you know, our scout Edgar Perez just really fell in love with the past past few years and getting to know him and watching him, you know, kind of develop and progress there in Puerto Rico. And he's got very good tools, um, really like his swing, how things work. Um, there is kind of some untapped power that we're not sure um, when when it'll kind of start to show up, but we we do believe that there's power potential there that um, he will eventually kind of grow into um he's got actions and hands and and a good enough arm to stay at shortstop he's a little bit um raw there right now as far as kind of knowing how to approach the ball and um kind of some of the rhythm and timing things that he'll need to improve on to be consistent at shortstop but a little bit similar to, to Cannon in that, you know, he's got the ability to do it and it'll really, a lot of it will come down to how, how much work and time and effort and, and, you know, in combination with how much desire he has to be a good source stop. So we'll kind of see how things play out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another guy that I definitely am going to get screamed at if I don't ask about 
Um, in part, in part because of the backstar story, part probably as much as anything is the fourth rounder, Noah Song, um, right hander out of the Navy. We've talked about him enough on here that people know the backstory. Um, first of all, I mean, true talent. You know, obviously you have to take his situation into account when you're lining up your board. I'm sure, but you know, as far as a value in the fourth round, how did you guys see him maybe on field talent wise, and then? You know, as far as what you can tell us publicly on the record, um, you know, we don't know specifically what this administration is going to do in terms of developing a new policy for Naval Academy or just Academy grads to play professional sports will be. But what do you guys think will be um, the situation for Song going forward, whether he'll have to, you know, serve for two years and come back or, or, you know, what will happen there? Yeah, I mean – I I know that this, as you mentioned, has been Mm -hmm. publicly um, uh, referenced to and from many different media outlets and so forth. And we kind of take the same stance in that we selected a very talented pitcher and we're very, very pleased and happy to have him in the organization. And it's obviously a very unique case and that there is some, you know, some relative uncertainty as far as how his career path, you know, will go, but we're, we're going to support him through that and kind of take it step by step and kind of see how things, how things play out. Um, as far as his talent, a little more specifically, we've been, uh, you know, we we were very impressed with them from the onset. Our scout Reed Grignani did an in, really an exceptional job in scouting him and getting to know him and just had really strong convictions on him going back to his junior year and has really just did a fantastic job in getting to know him and having a really thorough um, process with him. So we're very pleased with him and he's, he's been excellent so far, um, you know, pitching for Lowell and um, it's really unique, also unique in the sense that he's a, you know, coming into the system as a college senior, but we think there are some, kind of considerable areas where we're going to be able to help him. Like, like for example, his change up is a pitch that he did not throw very much in college. And as we've kind of scouted him through the summer, he's, he appears to have a very good change up. So that's something that I know our player development staff is going to be working on with him and, and, um, you know, helping him kind of continue to add polish to that, you know, that third pitch and those things, which will obviously really help him as he, you know, kind of makes his way up to the major leagues. So, Love it. Um, I know we don't have you for too much longer, so maybe maybe one more question for you, Mike. Um, and this was one that, that Ian Cundell, our director of scouting, mentioned. But when, you're, when you guys are scouting pitchers, you know, I think we've talked in the past about, you know, there's this narrative about the Red Sox and developing pitching, which – I don't think it's necessarily fair if if you consider, especially I'm sure one of the things that's dying to jump off the edge of your tongue right now, if you look at the fact that guys like Logan Allen and Sean Anderson who were drafted and were in the Red Sox by and were in the Red Sox system and then traded are now turning into major league starting pitchers. Um, But when you guys are looking at scouting, um, you know, when you see a guy, is it, Hey, this guy's a starter. We're looking for starters. Hey, this guy's a reliever, you know, line them up differently or is it just you know how do you scout starter versus reliever how do you draft for starter versus reliever or is it just get arms get the best talent into the system we'll work it out later obviously knowing what we know from scouting them but just let's just get the balls of clay and see what we can work out yeah like that part of the draft evolution is has really kind of changed in the past few years so we still take the pretty consistent stance that we're going to have a preference for starting pitchers over relief pitchers. Um, in many drafts or some drafts, there's always a, you know, a guy that you may want to consider as just being a really elite closer type that can get to the major leagues very quickly. And in that case, you, you know, you may have some more intimate conversations on how, you know, how that type of person would compare with a, you know, a number three or four starter projection. And occasionally you do have those things. Um, other than that, um, again, you know, we're going to, we're going to preference and try to recognize the guys that we think can start. And 
you know, send them out as starters, do our best to develop them as starters. And if they do end up, you know, in the bullpen and, and, and end up being a good reliever, that's not the, you know, that's not the end of the world um, in most cases. So. Um, Makes sense. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do I, all right. So we, we need to probably let you go. I think I'm looking at the clock and it looks like you're, about to turn into a yeah, weekend. I've got time. Okay, I've got, I've got time. All right, well, time. let's go with. Uh, let me just ask you this then: uh, of the guys we haven't talked about, and there's a bunch. I, I could take three hours of your time and just go down the list and talk about every guy in this list. But you know, we, we've mentioned a couple guys, but is there anyone? I call it the Jaron Duran question. You know, is there anyone on this list that you think is a guy that might garner more attention the longer, you know, the more we kind of see him in the system? Might be kind of maybe not a pop up guy from, you know, a guy we weren't even looking at to something. But, um, you know, does anybody stand out as kind of a, a favorite of yours or for whatever other reason you think we should keep an eye on from this draft class? Yeah, well, since I, I would probably have mentioned Chris Murphy, mm-hmm. but since mm-hmm. we've touched on him a little bit, um, I'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about a couple other guys. The first yeah. one would be Brock Bell, um, yeah. yeah, and he's a little bit of an another kind of under the radar type guy because he was hurt. Um, and once again, Stephen Hargett, our scout in that area, did a did a really really nice job and kind of recognizing his abilities. He didn't pitch that much this spring. We ended up having him up to, uh, to Fenway for a little bit of work, a little bit of a workout and got to know him there. He's the son of Jay bell. Um, yep. if you weren't aware of that and, uh, he's just a really interesting guy. He's kind of a ball of clay. He's physical. He's got a, he's got a workable delivery. He throws strikes. He's got a fastball that we've seen up to 97. Um, from a development standpoint, his breaking ball is a little, you know, secondary pieces are a little bit, you know, far away. So, um, depending on how, how those, you know, those pitches develop is going to determine a lot, but he's, he's got the makings of, uh, you know, a starting pitching prospect and he's, He's big and strong and has, you know, has a really good fastball. So I'm very excited to have him in the system and, and see how, how he uh, develops. And the other person that would be interesting to note would be Brendan Salucci, who's mm-hmm. a um, left-hand pitcher that we got out of Tulane, who's, you know, again, he's um, probably ends up in the bullpen, but he, he has the kind of stuff where he could move relatively quickly. Um, he's been up to 97 already this summer and he's got, you know, he flashes of, you know, good secondary pitches. Um, just a big kind of big, strong, durable guy. that has got a really good arm. So those are the types of pitchers that we, you know, we're open to all different shapes and sizes, but those are typically the type that we have a preference for, you know, as far as guys with deliveries, um, you know, good, really good hard fastballs and big strong guys so those are those are two that will be worth um you know worth keeping a close eye on moving forward nice nice and then as far as you know i had mentioned um you know getting a little bit creative a couple guys who had really interesting backstories that you guys signed this year um and i'm just kind of interested on how those played out is is daniel baxt the infielder out of stanford and Felipe Franks, the uh, "quote unquote" right-handed pitcher <laughs> out of out of UF, mm-hmm. um, you know, those were two guys that were a little off the radar. Though I guess Franks, we should have maybe, I guess, you know, UF quarterback is a is a archetype that we need to throw in there with Team USA guys and guys who played on the Cape as players. We need to keep an eye out for you guys drafting and signing now. But um, I guess how did those come about? It, again, we talk about scouts that have. You know, you guys have had around for a minute that that you trust in in, in finding these guys. How how did those come about, and and you know how did those uh, you know come to even be on the radar? Yeah, so Bax, um, we had history with going back to high school. He was actually one of the high school hitters um, three years ago that we identified as being one of the better bats in the draft. He ended up you know, being a really tough sign and, and ended up going to Stanford where, where he kind of had a, um, had a really good freshman year, went through some struggles as a sophomore and then decided to kind of take a break, uh, from the action there, um, you know, this year. And 
after doing so, he, you know, really like, like a lot of kids, they, they kind of realized how much they missed the game and reached out to some scouts. Our, our guy in Northern California, Josh Lavendera did a, did a not really nice job of kind of being, you know, engaging in that and being a part of that and going to see him work out and recognizing, you know, the bat, he wasn't able to scout him, but he, you know, he did, he was pretty convicted that, you know, he's a really good looking hitter and that, kind of pieced on to what we already knew about him. So, um, again, just trying to encourage our guys to be creative and considering these type, um, you know, players a little bit deeper in the draft was a big part of it. And then I have to certainly give some credit to our assistant scouting director, Paul Taboni, who was, you know, so many times I kind of lose track of these type things. And he's just, he's just incredibly smart and really gifted and, and just kind of tracking these type situations. And he reminded me on numerous occasions, including during the draft, like, Hey, let's don't forget, you know, about, about him. And, um, you know, uh, obviously we ended up taking him. So that was kind of the bits and pieces of that process and how those types of things work. And, um, yeah, in uh, in in the case of Franks, it's something that I've been uh, I've been encouraging and, and emailing our scouts about really for many years. In, in that, you know, just be open to kind of those type of um, possibilities, whether it's a catcher that we don't think is a prospect that has a great arm, or um, a quarterback that's athletic and and you know has the types of things, types of attributes that we would look for in a pitcher and just turn them in. And we can, you know, a lot of times you'd be surprised at what our draft board looks like after the, (laughs) after the 20th round, it's completely demolished and to have the opportunity to consider, you know, really, really interesting guys, even though, you know, they may be long shots in some cases, or they may not have even played baseball recently, um, in the case of Franks that, you know, these things are just real interesting possibilities and, um, you know, we'll see how his football career plays out, but if it's, you know, if he doesn't have professional football options, we're very excited to get him into the system and a Red Sox uniform in the spring and kind of see how, you know, see what he looks like. Um, he's certainly big and physical and athletic and we already know that he's got a really good arm uh without even really practicing much with the baseball so Mm -hmm. he's exciting and we'll see how things play out nice nice all right well all right i think i think we got to let you go we got to make sure that you're ready to uh to to you know do the the, your your homestead duties in in addition to those of the the Red Sox front office requires of you but uh, as always Mike it's a pleasure to chat with you I'm sure we'll be staying in touch uh throughout the the you know the progression of these guys and the next class and all of that but uh it's a pleasure as always to talk to you thanks for taking the time we appreciate it yeah appreciate you having me I always love sharing the stories and um um, we we'll look forward to doing it again one day soon if you'll have me back. So oh, thank for, you. For sure. Yeah, you can, you can count on that one. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right. Well, that's our interview with Mike Rickard. Um, great stuff, Ian. I, I, I learned a lot. Hopefully our listeners did. Um, since you're not the guy who did it, what, what stood out most to you? Just kind of maybe just a tidbit or a nugget that you found most interesting. Um, well, I guess just two things, like briefly, just the Chris Murphy talk. Um, mm-hmm. It's clear they were high on him, and it's just interesting because obviously he's someone, as we've talked about on this show, uh, and I've talked about on Twitter, uh, he's someone I really like and have been impressed with. Mm-hmm. And he continued it again last night. I think he threw like three more yeah. shutout innings last yeah. night. Um, so, yeah, he the fact that they were pretty high on him um, was interesting. And I think the big one to me was the Noah Song changeup thing. Yeah. Um, right. cause when I saw him and we discussed it, like I thought his changeup was his best secondary pitch yep. and it's just interesting to hear that it wasn't really something he threw in college and no. they've been kind of working on it. So if that pitch can take a step forward and there's some untapped potential in there, then look out. That's very interesting. That can be three above average pitches. I mean, if we, if he gets the slider back to where he had it in college, cause it sounds like that's down for him a little bit right now from what it was. Yeah, yeah, because I don't think it was an it was like an average pitch when I saw it. But yeah, right. but if he could have three above average pitches, I mean, that's a guy who could move quick for um, sure. So we'll see yeah. with him. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and this kind of plays into the Chris Murphy thing, and we know now that they really liked Thad Ward last year when they drafted him, who was really when you saw his profile when they drafted him, it's like okay, this is a guy who mostly was in the bullpen for UCF. 
and like, yeah, you know, to come out and now be doing what he's doing. But then it turns out that they really did like him. Um, and they, you know, they, he had advocates in the draft room. The piece that he said at the very beginning about, and this wasn't meant as a knock on any of the national publications or anything like that. We were both like, look, we respect the hell out of what those guys try and do. But because a guy is not a top 200 MLB prospect, not a top 500 BA prospect, doesn't mean that the guy stinks. The draft board, and I've been I've been preaching this for a long time on our forum. The draft board for a major league club is not the exact same thing as what BA has published, what Baseball America has published, what MLB Pipeline has published. They they've seen these guys. They have different reads on them. They're also not necessarily sharing that information. If they've got a guy like Chris Murphy in their back pocket, they're not telling Baseball America about him. They're not telling Jim Callis about him. You know, the the top 50 guys, yeah, why are you going to hold back about that? Everybody knows who they are. But, you know, when you see a guy who gets picked in, in a spot that's a little confusing, don't assume it's just them going completely off the reservation. You know, there's a reason they're doing it. Now, are they always going to be right? No. They've missed on picks in the past, for sure. I'm sure Mike would be the first person to admit that. But, you know, there's a reason for that. So it's, you know, it's not that you should ignore rankings, but it's just they're they're only worth so much after a certain point. Um, so I thought that was interesting. He had some really good notes on a lot of the draftees. Ian mentioned Noah Song, Chris Murphy. Um, got some stuff in there about Brock Bell. Got some stuff. I got the we got the background a little bit on on Daniel Baxt on on a guy who made his season debut last night. Ian in uh, Felipe Franks. He did. Yeah, he didn't look very good. I he, watched some of that yeah, game. Yeah. He did run for a touchdown, so he definitely leads the system in touchdowns. I mean, I also don't like Florida in general <laughs> so true. like this the university of florida football team so yeah i uh yeah. i it was kind of unfortunate that they won but yeah. what can you do oh, well. so yeah. um but yeah i mean hopefully you guys enjoyed that interview with mike um you know we I, I would like to try and get a couple more of those type of interviews uh maybe during the off season i know we always say it but scheduling can be tough you know for these guys who their jobs happen at night our day jobs happen during the day Scheduling can be kind of tough, but we were able to make that work on short notice this week with Mike. So thanks to Mike. Thanks to Mike for his time. And thanks to you all for listening. Thanks to Podcast Joe 2.0, our podcast producer, editor, publisher. Um, Ian, thank you for hopping on. You can follow Ian on Twitter at Ian Cundall. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. You can follow me at S-P Chris Hatfield, spelt like it sounds, and follow the website's Twitter at Sox Prospects. Make sure you're checking out the website. Uh, again, patreon.com slash Sox Prospects to support the site and get access to the Patreon game updates. Uh, I'm thinking at this point a lot of those are going to have to go up later this evening um, after I get into Philly. I've got a little bit of travel coming up. Um, but yeah, and, uh, oh, uh, one more thing. Oh, and if you want to send us a question, concern, comment, uh, any kind of feedback, something you want us to talk about, we want to talk about what you want to hear about. It's podcast at SoxProspects.com, and we'll get to those on our next episode of the podcast. Ian, I think we're good. Let's get out of here. All right. Uh, for Ian, I'm Chris. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye.